Good morning and welcome to the Doctors with Transplant session. I'm Manu Varma. I uh, received a, a kidney transplant as a young adult, as a child as a young adult, and then I'm a pediatric transplant cardiologist in New York at NYU Langone. So I am one person who has lived the trajectory of receiving a transplant as a child, becoming an adult with that same transplant, and then also navigating a medical career with that. So I have a lot of experience with that, but some of the elements that I have no firsthand experience on are the unique challenges of being a young woman navigating the same path. So today we're very fortunate to have a panel of four women who are all transplant recipients, who are all physicians working in transplantation, who have their own stories to share about navigating the many challenges and opportunities this can pose. So first for logistics for the session, um, we'll have the Q&A open and we're really looking forward to your questions. I have several questions for this panel, a lot of things I wanna know, but we really wanna hear your questions, so keep them coming. And we'll start with the panel and I guess we'll start with Dr. Silke Niederhaus. Hi hey everyone, I'm Silke Niederhaus. I, um grew up in Germany where I had my first transplant at age 11 in 1988. It's a long, long time ago. That kidney lasted for about 30, 31 years, and I went straight to my second kidney transplant um, in 2019, so approaching five years. And I currently work as a transplant surgeon at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and I'm also Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and uh, Professional Development. Nice to meet you all. Welcome. Great. Um, we can move on to Dr. Julie Bond. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Bond. Um, I had a liver transplant at the age of 12 um, when at Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, for acute liver failure. And then I followed my dreams and became a pediatric hepatologist at Cincinnati Children's. So um, I'm assistant professor uh, within the department, their division of gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition. Um, I'm a pediatric hepatologist here. Very excited to join. Great. Um, Dr. Catherine Smith. Catherine, you muted. Ah, novice error. Uh, my name is Catherine Smith. I am um, a pediatric transplant hepatologist and medical director of liver transplant at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. I have a interesting story, but I, I originally had a liver transplant in 1998 uh, for autoimmune hepatitis. I went on to have a, another liver transplant due to hepatic artery thrombosis in 19... 98 of December. And then I had to get a multivisceral transplant in August of 1999. Um, so I got a stomach, liver, pancreas, kidney, and small intestine. And I've had that transplant now for about 25 years. Um, and like Julie said, I was able to achieve my dream of becoming a doctor and a pediatric liver doctor at that. Great. And finally, Dr. Kristen Ramones. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. I am Kristen Ramones. I am a um, double lung transplant recipient. Um, I had my transplant back in 2017. I just celebrated my seven year anniversary uh, one month ago. Um, I had the double lung transplant for pulmonary hypertension um, and I was able to go back to medical school, finish residency, and now I'm a pediatric pulmonology fellow at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. Nice to meet you all. Great. So we can get started. Um, I should turn my camera on. We can turn all the cameras on, I guess, and get the panel ready. Again, we're open and ready for questions in the Q&A and in the chat, uh, preferably the Q&A. But I'll start. Um, we got everyone's professional history, and I know this, but for the audience, um, who all have children, again, either biologically or in their lives, and how has navigating the pregnancy parenting journey been in this? 
life as a transplant recipient and as a physician. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Silky raised her hand first. We'll start with her. Uh, Julie had her camera and her, her <laughs> unmute at first. It doesn't matter. Um, so I always wanted a lot of children. Um, my husband and I got married. He comes from a large family. And when I first went to their house for Christmas, I was just so overwhelmed by the floor entirely covered in presents. I was like, oh, I want that in my life. Um, but in any case, we, you know, planned and ended up obviously thinking ahead took a little while to get pregnant but you know I was like fine I was a fellow I was busy running around and like this could take a while and I ended up pregnant not knowing I was pregnant for a while as a good 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 doctor and um when I took my new job in Baltimore so it was kind of a, a career hit was worse than than the actual pregnancy pregnancy went fine the kid was what three weeks early and uh, a few pounds light, which is sort of what happens, right? On average, they're two pounds light and a, a month early. If you have them as a transplant patient, it's obviously a high risk pregnancy because you have to adjust your medications and there usually is some growth restriction. Um, but he came out nice and normal, happy, healthy, tiny as could be. And um, yeah, being a parent has been honestly the greatest thing in my life. The trouble happened for me is when we switched my immunosuppression back from what it was pre-transplant to or pre-pregnancy to like during pregnancy, we had switched to obviously safe for pregnancy meds. And when we switched back, there was a little lag in how the medications transitioned that nobody anticipated. And my levels were a little lower than they were before. So I uh, ended up with rejection from that. And that's what ultimately led to that failing kidney. So I was kind of parenting while back in kidney failure, which was probably the most stressful part. And then had another transplant when my son was six years old um, and he's happy, healthy, precocious, like I was, it's not a normal child. Um, but, you know, otherwise has been probably the greatest blessing in my life to have him um, working full time again. Now I worked part time for a little while when my kidney wasn't working so well, but it's all a balance. And my husband and I had always talked about like how we both had very ambitious careers and uh, we both wanted to parent together and we didn't want to just have, you know, someone else raise any children that we would have. But in the beginning, then we tried to adopt. That was a big journey, very difficult. Um, ultimately, during that journey, my husband was found to have kidney cancer and trying to donate his kidney to me. Um, so then it became even more difficult to try to adopt because if you have cancer, people don't want to give you their children because, well, what if you die? And a lot of people just don't know that renal cancer is very survivable. So we gave up on adopting. And uh, now I have a, a 10 year old who's almost 11 who's like, Mom, I don't want any siblings. I don't want any other children in the home. I don't want to share. And you are definitely not getting pregnant again because you know what happened to your kidney first time around. And then he's like, you know, learned about childbirth and how it can have issues and complications so he's like no so uh he, he's the little watchdog at home it's awesome Glad, yeah as i say it sounds like you have a, a feisty one at home that's lots of fun um so my uh kind of pregnancy journey i mean i always was wanted to be a mom when i was younger i was transplanted at the age of 12 and at about, it was like 16 or 17. I was curious, not interested at that time, but curiously asked my pediatric hepatologist, like, hey, can I ever get pregnant? Like, is that a thing in my life? Um, Cause they had never brought it up. And I just, you know, random question at the annual follow-up. Um, and the response I got is, well, I have multiple patients that have healthy children. And I was like, oh, all right. So it's a possibility. Now I'd say that, uh, you know, everyone's transplant journey is unique. Um, and it is not always, you know, it, it, it's something that definitely needs to be discussed with the uh, transplant physician, because there are different situations that everyone's in um, and risk factors and health factors that need to be accounted for. Um, so nonetheless, you know, I was like, took that as great news, moved on. Um, and then when I was ready for family planning, um, which I was always very preventative of it because I, I didn't want any surprises. Um, but then when I was ready for family planning, you know, I talked to my now adult hepatologist um, of, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. And I, luckily, I was on tacrolimus monotherapy or the only immunosuppression. So we didn't have to alter any medications. 
Um, and uh, he said, you know, you'll let's get in with a high risk uh, OB as like a consultant um, before you even get started. And then things actually went very smoothly. Um, did have increased lab monitoring and did have to adjust some TACRO levels just with the physiology of pregnancy and increased blood volume, um, but just kind of watch labs pretty closely. Definitely a lot of communication um, because I did actually have my high risk OB and transplant hepatologist at different centers just because of how I chose that. Um, so I definitely did a lot of self-advocacy and communication, um, but there's no issues, um, you know, specifically liver transplant recipients are at risk in solid organ in general for, you know, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, high blood pressure, preeclampsia, et cetera. So uh, luckily escaped all that, um, carried my daughter to full term. Um, was induced and that went very smoothly. Um, she came out a little small, but not, not considered IUGR. She was just a little small for gestational age, um, but went home with me and thir within 36 hours. And now she's a very healthy, thriving four-year-old girl. Um, and it's been amazing. She's been, you know, the light of my life and what I look forward to every day. So um, overall, you know, high risk, but very smooth. Great. Um, Catherine, biological kids aside, I know you got married last year or year before, somewhat recently, um, and I know it was a story. Is that something you can tell us how your husband came into your life? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I, you know, I I wasn't somebody that always wanted to have children. I think it, I think it was kind of in the back of my head, but it wasn't something on a bucket list of mine, nor was getting married for that matter. Um, but I met my husband in kind of a serendipitous way. I was, uh, I reconnected with him. He was somebody I went to high school with. We were friends in high school. And I ended up moving to Baltimore for my job and also for love. Um, and in that move, I acquired two stepchildren. So that has been a lot of fun for me. I, I am able to, you know, you're not exactly like a mom, but you get to play a role and have, it you know, emphasize or influence on kids. Um, I think because I was a multivisceral transplant, it's a lot harder. It's not quite as straightforward as um, kidney or liver. There are multivisceral transplant recipients that have had children, but I know it's very risky. And um, it's a, a lot more planning involved. And I know it has happened, um, but I think that the risks for my team just did not outweigh the benefits. So I would recommend the way I did it. If you really want kids, um, of course, you could always have you could try to adopt, but as as Silky said, that's really difficult nowadays. But yeah, that's that's my story when it comes to children. Great. And then Kristen, to round it out, as scary pregnancies, pulmonary hypertension is the top of this pediatric cardiologist list. Um, like I know you have your husband in your life. I actually don't know anything about your story. So um, whatever <laughs> yes. you're willing to share. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so um, again, I have pulmonary hypertension and obviously it's very risky to get pregnant. So I was told I could not get pregnant when I had the pulmonary hypertension. Um, after my double lung transplant, I, you know, I'm on tacrolimus, I am on Salcept. And because I've been doing so well these past seven years, I am very hesitant to switch over um, any medications. Um, so I am going through the process of IVF right now. I actually did two cycles uh, just recently, and I'm hoping to do surrogacy. Again, Every what Julie said, every <laughs> transplant journey is very special to the person who has the transplant, and, and mine is unique, and, my, and I'm going to do IVF, um, hopefully do surrogacy. If that doesn't work out, um, I've always wanted to become a mom, so I'm hoping to do adoption if that, that ends up not working. So. Great. Um, a couple of you alluded to comments. So whoever is most comfortable medically answering the question in the chat of does immunosuppression affect fertility? Does it affect, I mean, I, I know the answer to this, um, embryonic development. And what are the medical considerations you were advised on or you advise your patients on for transplant and pregnancy? Whoever feels most confident on this topic. Mm -hmm. You have a surgeon in the group. Uh, the surgeons are naturally confident, Manu. So like you got to be Go careful what you ask for. Um, they're also obnoxiously loud, um, including me. I'm talking about myself. So, I mean, I think in my mind, probably the Celsept or the mycophenolate is the biggest risk. It actually has a serious warning for birth defects, and there's a number of them, ear malformations, you know, ENT malformations, anorectal malformations. So, 
um, it's a very terrible idea to get pregnant on that medication. And it's a very terrible idea to just stop that medication um, when you find out you're pregnant because the medication stays with its effects in your system for another two to three months. So it's essential to see a high-risk OB and really plan. There are other medications many people are on, I was not, that can also affect, um, you know, outcomes um, of a baby if you're if you're trying to grow one. So it really makes sense to see a high-risk OB several months before you're thinking about getting pregnant. Um, and then there are so many different patients, right? I mean, in my case, I was not very sensitized. For me, getting another transplant was not going to be a big major hurdle. Um, I only have kidney um, disease, right? I have IgA nephropathy, so there weren't any other severe underlying risk factors or comorbidities to consider with pregnancy. I mean, I think that can really vary. Like I've taken care of other patients who have a lot of PRA, a lot of antibody. They already had a little underlying, you know, rejection in their kidney. Their kidney function wasn't perfect. They have high blood pressure in addition to it or diabetes. So the real risk of pregnancy is very, very individual. And I think if you're thinking about it, it's absolutely key to talk to both your transplant team and then to a high-risk OB um, to figure out what's best. Great. So um, shifting gears a little bit to what usually happens before pregnancy, a question from the chat of when you are starting a new relationship or when you are growing a relationship, how do you bring up the topic of the fact that you had a transplant? How do you navigate, you know, once the word is out, like the discussions that will inevitably create on, on both sides of the partnership? Um, I think we'll shift gears a bit. Um, Catherine, do you want to start with that one with it all relatively fresh in your mind? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I think I, I've tried probably every way. <laughs> I did a lot of dating, you know, after my, I mean, I'm now, I'm, I got married at like 44. So I think there's, there's different ways you can do it. I don't, I don't always think it's the best to bring it straight up at the beginning. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, I guess, myths and misunderstandings about transplant out in the community. So, you know, depending on who you're talking to, you know, if you're dating somebody in the medical field, you may not want to share it too soon because they know all the bad things get happen. If you're sharing it with somebody that's more naive, they don't quite understand what it is. So I think you you probably something that I would recommend that you broach after you've sort of gotten to know someone. Um, and then what I'll say to, to all the women out there who are nervous about it, when you find somebody that really cares about you, uh, that this is not going to matter to them. You know, at the end of the day, it's just another part of you or an experience you had. But people who really care for you, they, they, this will be just something that happened to you in the past. Now, when you get ready to settle down with somebody, you have to make sure your partner understands the significance of what you've been through and, you know, how to manage that, how to take care of you if you get sick and those sort of things. But that is something that's um, anxiety provoking when you're dating as a young female, mm -hmm. um, whether to tell somebody about your, you know, your baggage as a transplant patient or not. So I think there's different ways you could do it, but that would be my my recommendation and feelings about it. Kristen, anything different or to add? I mean, I, don't, I actually don't know what the trajectory was between your transplant, your relationship, and how you've navigated all similar things, I'm sure. Yeah, so I actually, um, I I met my husband in college um, and I was, I was very healthy then. And then the pulmonary hypertension happened when I was in med school. So he, he's been with me throughout the whole process. Um, so I've been really, really lucky to have him by my side. He's been really supportive, but I'm sure it's, it was a little, <laughs> I'm sure he's a little bit scared through everything. And, um, but again, I think it's, it's good to be upfront, but, um, you know, Catherine said it's good to be upfront with your partner, but I guess the timing of everything, um, is important too. Julie had a fair bit of nodding to Catherine's responses and anything yeah. different or to add or... I um, I mean, mostly I think she put it very well because it's everyone's like unique kind of how they feel about it and what you're comfortable sharing. 
Um, and I've always been one who says like, I want people to know who I am kind of before they learn that I'm a transplant recipient. Um, just because I define myself in so many ways. And so kind of getting to know somebody and then opening up that conversation. Um, and it, everyone's a little bit different. So there's no right or wrong. Um, but how to really get into that conversation. I feel like for myself, kind of looking back, that it, it it almost did happen a little bit naturally over time, you know, not in the first couple dates, um, but then something, you know, you would talk about your career and your aspirations, and then that would loop in like, oh, well, why have you always wanted to be a liver doctor since you were a kid? And you're like, oh, well, you know, or some type of something in your life that like that story and it gets looped in and, you know, it's, uh, it, it is something that I, I didn't don't like to share like right off the bat because then yeah you kind of get labeled or something like that um, and I just think there's so much more to a person than, than than their health even though it's something we're very proud of too so okay I think they covered a lot of ground but you've been dealing with this a long time anything to add that well, I, I got advice with my first kidney transplant I told the surgeon back then in Germany he was a urologist and I said well, he said, he asked, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be a transplant surgeon. So the first thing he said, which was in, in hindsight, very wrong, but this was a different era. He said, um, don't get involved with guys because they'll just ruin your career plans. So that was his advice. And I kind of took it. So, and I was very ugly child on steroids and my hair was all crazy. And I was like, you know, above average in weight for my height and at the time, nobody in high school was even remotely interested. I also, you know, had this unfortunate other burden, which was that I was, uh, you know, above average smart for most other people in school. And so I think I had sort of a double intimidation factor of ugly and smart. Um, and so I don't know which was the bigger barrier, right? but I never even dated anyone until college. Um, and again, like Julie said, it comes out naturally at some point, right? It may not need to be the first time you meet someone, but I'm pretty open about, you know, my transplant. I take my meds everywhere. If I need to take them, I've just never felt the need to go to the bathroom to hide the fact that I'm taking pills. And people naturally ask questions. But I think for me, the bigger barrier in dating was that I then pursued surgery. Um, and, you know, I had a boyfriend in medical school that broke up with me over the fact that I wanted to be a surgeon and that that was important to me. Um, so I think that was almost harder in terms of what my career choices affected about my relationships than being a transplant patient itself. Great. Um, sh shifting gears a little bit, though not entirely. Um, I have a question from the Q&A of, has mental health been... I'll just read this verbatim. I think it's perfectly phrased. Has mental health been a big issue for you as a young woman who has gone through transplant? And do you have any other, other suggestions for women walking this path? Um, Kristen, do you want to start with this one? <laughs> yes, I think this is a very good question. And I think it's a very important one. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a young woman going through IVF. And I think it could be very difficult, too, because I have a lot of friends who are starting families and um, all I want to do is become a mom. So it's, it is hard at times to be like, oh, you know, I wish I could be healthy and I can just have pregnancy naturally. Um, so it is very important um, to be open about how you're feeling. I think that I, I go to therapy. I haven't been going to therapy as much as I like to, but I do go to therapy for it um, because I, I do feel like I need um, extra support on outside eyes, kind of just helping me through things. I am also very open to um, how I'm feeling it to my husband too, because I know that he is feeling some sort of way. Um, I think he tries to support me through it and we try and support each other through it too. Um, so, you know, I think mental health is very important and it helps with your physical health too. And I think if you're feeling any sort of feelings about um, pregnancy, um, going through the IVF process, if you are going through the IVF process to talk to someone about it. Um, in some order, I guess, Catherine, next in general, um, you know, this is something you've been dealing with for a very long time, through a time of growth. Um, how do you feel mental health has played in over all those years? Well, I think mental health is extremely important, extremely important. And I would say that um, if your mental health and your resources and support are not there, you're not going to do well physically. 
Um, and so, you know, people like to ask, why did you do so well? Why did you do better than other people? And I always just say it was a support that I had, right? It was my family, friends, everybody that rallied around me. Um, I think, and because of that, I was able to, my mental health was good through this. Of course, I had times that were, all of us, despite having a transplant, especially nowadays, have times where we feel down or, or we want to be different or we wish we were more normal, quote unquote. I think, you know, there were times when I was on medication and the acute period, um, you know, to address certain things. I've had therapists. Uh, but I think the most important part is I had that support, my family, my physicians that took care of me, my friends were incredibly supportive. And it was always the message that I always got was you can do this, you can get through it. And so from that, that side, I think I'm very lucky and blessed, but I know not everybody has that, but I would say in whatever way you're able to get that sort of support and encouragement uh, continually, then that, that will help you. And so at the end of the day, yes, mental health is absolutely important to address and make sure that you are feeling good about yourself and where you're going and what you're doing so that you can heal properly. And, and the healing never stops. That's the other thing to say. You know, you're always, there's always changes. We can all, you know, we're all in a chat group. We all know each other. Um, there's always something new coming up. I just got my hip replaced last week. So there's always something coming up that you have to deal with again. You know, there's all these side effects down the line. So it's it's important to maintain those support networks throughout your life after transplant. So Julie, I guess both for yourself and for what you tell your patients as as they're anticipating hopefully a very long life with a transplant. But as Catherine said, the issues never completely go away. It's a long road. What's your thoughts over those years? Yeah, well, and I definitely uh, being transplanted as a preteen, I guess is 12, but turned 13 shortly after. Um, it was a huge impact on me at that time. I mean, and I went from a, a very healthy, um, active, athletic 12 year old got sick very quickly. Um, transplant experience was a whirlwind and then huge weight gain with the, the steroids. Um, couple early rejections, so long-term high-dose steroids. And so when I was going back to, you know, seventh grade, so excited to be normal again, um, and seventh graders are mean, <laughs> and I went back so excited to see friends, and, you know, a number of them I hadn't really kept in close contact, keep in that bubble of, of early post-transplant, um, and I went back to seventh grade, and people were like, who is she, and what is she doing here, um, because I was very moon-faced and gained a lot of weight, um, so that triggered a pretty significant significant depression for me um, at, you know, 12, 13 years old. And I cried every night and was like, this is the worst part of transplant. Like I had surgical problems, rejection problems. Um, but the depression was really the hardest thing for me, you know, even looking back 20 plus years, um, that it was difficult. And, you know, I talked to a psychologist, but at 13, I was like, everything's great. <laughs> um, so my support, I mean, my, my family was a huge support. I had a church group that was a huge support. Um, but what really made me open my eyes as a teenager, because it was actually two years later, so I got pushed through with my, my support is when my transplant coordinator connected me to another transplant recipient who she was a teenage girl who had recently been transplanted and had some depression. Um, so I was actually connected as her mentor, uh, but it opened my eyes of like, oh my gosh, there's other girls out there like me um, that are going through some similar things. And uh, that's really inspired me of just the power of peer mentoring um, and really kind of helping relieve that isolation and that feeling of like wanting to be normal, but you're never quite who is normal, but um, never quite the same as your peers. So finding other people to connect with on that aspect um, was extremely powerful for me. So Silke, I know you're tough. But what has been the uh, long, what is, what, you know, again, you've, after 30 something years of so many ups and downs and good and bad things, how have you seen mental health play out through your story? 
interestingly, we made fun of the fact that there was a pediatric psychologist on our first transplant evaluation team when we were like eight, nine, 10 years old, right? Like, um, because I really didn't have any anxiety, any depression. I was just like, this is life. This is what happens. You take the next thing and do, right? And I moved through my first transplant very easily, had rejection episodes, was just still ready to tackle the world kind of in that, you know, invincible state at age 11, 12. Um, going back to school, similar like Julie, right? The kids are mean in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I didn't end up having no friends. I had previously just had one close friend. She found another while I was absent and I had no one. Um, I ended up instead bonding a lot with people um, of different ages through my sports club in Germany where we did field hockey. And those th that allowed me for all sorts of relationships with older mentors, even peer you know, age groups who didn't know me before. So they didn't have to deal with how I changed physically. Um, so the introduction to new people on that side was was really what kind of got me through my teenage years. And it wasn't until college that I then moved from Germany to Alabama that I was like a new sensation. But up there, I was like cool because I was foreign, right, as a German. And that's when I really started having positive relationships in my life again. So that was hard, but I never really soak out therapy. Um, you know, my parents, I guess, don't believe in that very much. I'm now more open to it. And I've had a coach, but not a therapist. And I, I feel like I'm a normal person. I think it grew resilience experiences like that of being rejected by peers. For me grew ultimately me into a more resilient person of what really matters in life. And I'm like, what these other teenage kids think is just not that important. And I knew that and I kind of treated it as that and I just moved through. And I had even a teacher who was like, oh, look all, we have a new student class. And I'm like, I'm not new, I've been here for a long time, right? Like, so it's bad when your own teachers don't recognize you, but like it happens and I moved through it. And then, you know, college to me was eye-opening because there I was just a normal person and it it just completely changed how I viewed myself and everything else. I think one point of advice I have for those of you who are parents with kids with transplant, treat them normally. Because I saw many of my peers in the hospital being so catered to by their parents that they didn't have any rules. They didn't have any limits. And the parents would bend over backwards to do whatever their children wanted and those children had a very, very hard time coping normally with stressors. And so the best thing you can do as, as a parent is to treat your kid like they're still just a kid. And yes, there's a limit on how much screen time you get even when you're sick. And no, you're not going to just get to eat all the chocolate you want, right? Like there are certain things in life that you need to do. And no, you still need to do your schoolwork. Like I have expectations of you. So don't be afraid to have expectations of your sick kids. They, they will rise to the challenge, but if you cater to them, they, they will not do as well. Great, thanks. So there's another I, question. I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, can I, just, I have one thing to that. Is, and probably Julie could, we could talk about this for a long time. And even Kristen, because we're all pediatric doctors. I think what Silky just said is so important um, to treat your kids normally and to not let them, it's really easy to, start to define yourself as a transplant recipient and to parents to define their kids as transplant recipients and their whole life. As Julie said earlier, she's not defined. Like she has a lot more about her than just being a transplant patient. Um, and I agree with Sophie. We see that so much now where the kids are catered to, to such a degree that they don't have the coping skills when they go back out. And it's really difficult to sort of elevate them back into normal life and, and pursuing success and et cetera. Great. So there's a question in the chat that is one that I would have asked myself if I had. Um, mean Girls is actually only a movie to me and a collection of memes now. Um, but the question as phrased is, how do you handle peer pressure, especially other girls, conforming to social norms, living dangerously, experimenting in college? I think a couple of you mentioned in the context of mental health, peer pressure, which I am sure is a different experience for girls and young women than for boys and young men. Whoever would like to start with that, building off your last answer, or going in a new direction on peer pressure as a girl with a transplant. I mean, I can talk about it. I think, so I, I went back to college um, maybe nine to 12 months after my transplant and I went right back in. <clears throat> and I know a lot of people thought that was wild, but I was kind of like, Julie, I wanted to go back. I mean, I wasn't in seventh grade, but I was like, get me back to real life. I'm ready to go. I mean. I thought I was, you know, 
the it girl. I mean, I had just had a transplant and even though I had a round face, no hair to me, I thought like, I can do this. This is nothing. So I went back to school and of course, you know, getting back into it is a lot different than you expect, but I wanted to go to the parties. I wanted to do all the things. I was in a sorority. Um, and so I would go to the parties and I would do the things. And what I'll say is that, you know, I, I don't advocate drinking, but at that time I didn't need to because everybody else was so drunk. They didn't realize that I wasn't. So I was able to just fly under the radar and go to everything. I was always the designated driver. Um, and so as I got older and, you know, it came to, to sort of peer pressure and stuff like that, I think, I think all of us here on this panel are very strong willed. We're very, um, we're very intelligent, obviously. And I think there, I don't think anybody on this panel are the kind of people that are going to be peer pressured into anything. So I think for the most part, my guess is that all of us would just say, we can't do that. Whether or not you want to give the reason for it or not is one thing, but you just had to know which crowds to hang out with, which crowds to avoid. Um, and you just come up with your excuses. Like, I can't do that because X, Y, and Z. If you want to use your transplant, it's a wonderful excuse a lot of times to say, I don't want to engage in this and this and this, you know? Um, but again, this kind of goes back to that, that mental support I talk about. You will find yourself being friends with people that understand and support you. And they're not going to put you in positions where you're peer pressured, you know? So that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. I mean, I definitely went, you know, after my transplant before I didn't have any of the experiences of college or anything. I started college and then was pulled out so after my transplant, I always say I was a late bloomer because I went back in and then I didn't really start living the life of a 20-year-old until I got into medical school. Um, and so, yeah, that would be my answer that you just put yourself with people that understand who you are and support you in all the ways that are important to keep you out of positions where you have to sort of look like a nerd because you don't want to do all the things other people want to do. Yeah, and I think that ties well into the other question in the chat of like, you know, my daughter's headed to college in the fall. What advice do you have? The best thing, the other best thing you can teach your kid is how to pick the right friends, right? Because if you pick the right friends, the peer pressure becomes less of a problem. Frankly, the first time I really had peer pressure was probably during surgical residency. Um, and I ultimately got peer pressured into eating sushi while pregnant from some of my transplant surgeon colleagues, right? Like, so... Um, which is really hilarious if you think about it, right? And I was like, fine, I'll go for sushi with you. And I, but I, I even then told them, I was like, I'll have the veggie roll, right? Because um, if you really need to go there, that I thought it was kind of funny. I have two transplant surgeons that know all the risks of immunosuppression. They've been to medical school. They should know about pregnancy. But I, I like, you know, you have to live your life. Um, but if you choose your friends wisely, then you'll know who to say yes to and who to say no to. And yeah, sure, people experiment and, you know, just don't experiment with your meds. You're probably okay. Get your yeah. vaccines. And I'll just add, um, you know, I definitely was a social butterfly in college that, yeah, I went to the parties. Um, I always had my red solo cup, but it was always full of water. And like, you know, I would play drinking games, but I had water. So people... <laughs> There was times every transition is different and how people express it. And like, I think transplant is cool. So initially I did kind of say like, yeah, because of transplant and some people's college kids reactions were just like uh, not intelligent or just frustrating to hear. Uh, so I actually quickly changed to like kind of making up fun stuff um of the, or just saying like oh yeah this is pure vodka when it's water no none of the college kids know any different um and it was also I kind of picked my my friends of yeah I had my few close friends that knew and would support me or like if someone was trying to be a little bit pushy or inappropriate like they would step up with me um and then yeah yeah I'd avoid those people so yeah you kind of have your kind of close group that know all the truth and then the you know other college kids that you can give them all sorts of stories and get creative with it um and it would make it a little entertaining great so we have a um we're doing great we have a lot of questions and only so much time there's a couple that i think we can knock off quickly and they're actually all for silke um and then i have one just to end us out with um so first of all my daughter would like to know if you were on cell set was it hard to get off cell set when you were pregnant i think for the ones who've had to do that for pregnancy 
I'm just nope. be a yes, no question. You just have to arm twist your kidney doctor into it. But if you tell them that you're going to get pregnant in a minute, they'll switch you off pretty quickly. Julie, same. <laughs> I've actually never been on salsa, oh, so I didn't. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that does help. Um, so, okay, the other question for you is, do you think the lack of anxiety over your transplant allowed you to successfully pursue a career in medicine? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I did have some anxiety, right? Like when I got transplanted, my kidney had a lot of rejection episodes and they were like 50-50 it'll last a year. So the first few years, every year we were like, oh, how many more, right? And by the time it lasted seven, because I'd had a friend that was the longest we'd heard of, I was like, well, it lasted seven years. It's still going strong. So I'm going to stop worrying about it. I just made the decision to stop mm -hmm. worrying about it, right? Like somewhere in high school. And then I just mm -hmm. went on with life. I made it through med school because I'm stubborn. I think my perseverance and stubborn personality kind of helped me get through med school more than anything else. Um, and then I did have a good bit more anxiety when that kidney failed, because now at that point in time, I was a mother, right? And now I was a mother with kidney failure, which the outcomes of long-term kidney failure are not great. And so that became kind of a five-year period where I struggled more with some anxiety, depression, slept a lot. Um, I had the same sleep schedule as my two-year-old. So if you want to know, right, like um, that was much, much harder that once I had my transplant back, that all settled back down within like a couple of weeks, right? Like, so it's uh, my personality is very much tied to my health. Um, I guess that's, you know, we all have certain periods and episodes of, of different feelings in life and they come and go, right? Feelings come and go. Even anxiety can come and go. Um, I think it's okay. Great. Um, I have one technical question for myself of, um, do men have to think about fertility issues with anti-rejection medicines? Um, does your transplant affect family planning? This has changed over the 24-ish years since I had a transplant. Um, Initially, I was advised that cells that would be an issue for males as well. That's a couple of retrospective studies that have made it into the European guidelines, but not American guidelines. Um, Serolimus rap rapamycin does affect sperm motility. So my doctors have said, yeah, well, you're better off on cell sept than rapa. Um, so again, like, like Julia, it's also what your current regimen is, which is obviously individual for everyone listening. I have no changes anticipated when, when life goes that way. So we'll mark that done. Um, just, I guess, a quick sort of round table of, you know, certainly everyone who hears about a transplant knows about rejection, knows about opportunistic infections. Can you just sort of quickly tell like what other medical issues have come up in the decades you've had a transplant? You know, Catherine mentioned a hip replacement, things that you might not have seen coming um, as part of the package with transplant. Mm -hmm. Not have seen coming, I can't say. Um, I think I was told early enough that skin cancer is an issue that people have long term, right? Um, and there are some good Australian papers that show after 30 to 35 years of immunosuppression that the skin cancer risk is 70 to 80 percent. So that's just true, but it's a very manageable thing to have skin cancer. So like I've had a couple of most surgeries for some squamous cells on my hand, one on my knee. I go to the dermatologist. They froze my face this morning, right? Um, and I'm just used to the freeze gun and I'm like, yep, I'm going to the dermatologist to get assaulted with a freeze gun again. No problem. Right. And other than that, I've been really fortunate. I haven't really had, I've had a couple of episodes of pneumonia here and there. I had a CMV infection, you know, once it was very mild, but people made a big deal about it. And mm -hmm. So little things that happen, you know, uh, it seems everyone around me freaks out more about stuff than I do. And I'm like, okay, fine. Yeah. I'll take some antibiotics on we go. Right. Like, um, I think overall it's, it's just life. Kristen with pH and a lung transplant. So a thoracic transplant and all the rest with that, any other medical issues you've had aside from getting pH and having a lung transplant? <laughs> yeah. Um, so for me, um, I mean, I'm in my thirties, I already have osteoporosis from my prednisone. So I get polio every six months. Um, and again, I had skin cancer too. I had the basal cell carcinoma on my, on my eyebrow. So, um, but nothing out of the ordinary that I did not expect to happen. Catherine, you mentioned the hip replacement and osteoporosis. It sounds like this is a bit of a theme and a uh, and a risk. Anything else that? Maybe well, wasn't? I think my my transplant was done so long ago that I think a lot of the the um, barrier or like the safety strides they take now. For instance, I lost my hearing, um, but I think now they're better at managing like drug levels. Um, and then, of course, avascular necrosis, which you hear a lot from steroids. So I have that in my 
ankles. As I said, I just got my hip replaced. Um, outside of that, um, you know, I'm like silky. I'm very laid back. So, you know, if I have an infection, usually it's people around me getting all riled up. I'm like, let's just take some antibiotics. Let's see what happens. Um, but I think for the most part, the things that that they teach you to be worried about are things that we worry about. So I don't really worry about them, but you know, skin cancer or your bones, making sure you treat your bones right, those kind of things are the things you always have to watch for. In terms of getting sick, I don't necessarily feel like I get sick more than other people. And I actually chose a field that's, you know, you know, I I started as a pediatric GI person. So, you know, as Julie can tell you, we deal with poop all day. So it's not really the most um clean field. So but I still don't feel, I think I probably get more sick from the aspect of like treating kids than anything else. But other than that, I, I feel like I live a pretty normal life and there's really not many things that are unexpected. Good. So for, um, to close out the session for, and in the interest of time, I guess a couple of questions I'll consolidate into one, that if you had 30 seconds to tell a kid, young woman or a young man, how you pull it all together, how you go from where you were as a young person starting off with a transplant to where you are now. I mean, you're all amazing and you know that. Um, how, 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 what would you say to, to get from here to there? What's gotten you there? What helps? Um, Julie, you want to start? <laughs> yeah, um, big question. But I'd say overall, I mean, a transplant journey is a journey. Um, the transplant journey and life has its ups and downs, but you have lean on your, you know, look for your support and your education, but don't let your transplant define who you are. Um, become your own self, you know, find your dreams, your passions, obviously ours are all kind of in medicine, but there's so much more out there um, and become your own person. And, you know, learning, I think that what also has helped us, you know, be successful is some resiliency and that support that comes along with it. So finding, you know, really trying to support building resiliency and confidence um, that I think that goes a long way. Kristen, thoughts again, there's a comment in the chat. It's very similar. Like my two-year-old has a transplant. So they're like just starting out with this very little one, a long way to go. What would you say to that whole journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole goal of transplant is to eventually be live an, as normal of a life as you can. Um, so again, treat your kids like they are normal kids. If they get in trouble, yell at them a little bit. Um, but again, be a little bit more precautious when especially, you know, daycare and respiratory infections, but treat them as a normal kid. I think the whole point of the transplant is to have a second chance of life and be able to do things that you weren't able to do before. Um, so keep going, be perseverant, do what you would love to do, achieve your dreams. Catherine, any thoughts on making it through three transplants, 25 plus years um, and the whole path on the way? So I would say that for the, the two-year-old, what I would say the mom is instill in your kid that they can do anything they want to do, right? That they are just like anybody else. So I was, you know, I was older when I got my transplant, I was 18, but I remember my mom telling me there was never a time where she said, you can't do something ever. And even my surgeons, you know, I said, I want to be a doctor. They said, go for it. Why, why not? You know, you'll hear a lot of naysayers. You'll have a lot of people in your ear telling you can't do stuff, telling you that your kid won't be able to do stuff. Um, and so I think my, my, my advice would be to always be positive, always make things positive and don't let your children, I say this to my parents all the time, you can be anxious but don't let your children see you be anxious because they are going to absorb that. And kids are so um, observant. They're like little sponges. And so you're going to have to find your own coping skills so that your children don't see them. And so I know my mom was anxious and scared and my dad, but I never saw that side of them. So um, yeah, I would say I, it's back to what Julie said. It's like having your support system, make sure your support system is really good um, and persevere as if you were just a normal person. Yes, you had a transplant. That was something you had to do to keep moving. And here you are. And so, okay, the last word, it's like if you had to bottom line it to a few seconds of what to say to someone who may have started when they were 11, and here you are. Mm -hmm. 
just like take care of your organ, whatever it is, right? Take good care of it because that thing doing well will be the one thing that will allow you to do what you really want to do. And then find your goal in life. And if you do that, I think you'll do just fine. Fantastic. Um, thank you to all of you for joining. Thank you to everyone in the audience for all of your questions. Um, I think this has been a fantastic session. I hope it's been as much help and as informative to everyone who's watching as it has been to me. I learned a lot. I also got a lot of lines and quotes that I'll continue to be stealing. Future. Uh, so thank you all for joining and we'll shift to that session. <laughs>